What happens at the point of death? I knew that I was going to die. There was a drunk driving in the T part of a road. Do you just disappear? I'm chanting this to myself. I've got to breathe. I've got to breathe. You've got to look up. So they put me into a drug-induced coma. They folded the boat in half like a peanut butter sandwich. Some people say there is a light. Oh, this tunnel began to close. Others describe a love more profound than any other. With my lungs filled with water, that's when it happened. Most near-death experiencers say the other side was more real than life on Earth. And when I let go, I let go of life. Consciousness Continues seeks answers to the question, what happens when we die? My name is PMH Atwater. I'm a near-death researcher. I began my work in 1978. My research base is nearly 4,000 adult and child experiencers. I had an experience myself. It was because of that experience that I became a researcher. And I've been doing it ever since. My name is Sandra Boyd and I decided to come and be a part of this documentary because in 2002, I had a near-death experience and afterwards I had absolutely no one to talk to and had a very hard time figuring out in the beginning what had happened to me. The type of person I was before my near-death experience had a lot of ego to it. Sales was a good game for me and it was all about the money. I had been sick for about three months, just lung infections that wouldn't go away. <coughs> I woke up in the morning and had this feeling like I was dying. About three o'clock in the afternoon, we raced to the emergency room. The next thing I remember is standing there telling the woman at the counter that I'm dying. They raced me into one of the rooms. My lungs were filling up while the doctors hadn't even had a chance to intubate me. I could hear the machine that was hooked up to me that was beeping. There was a nurse standing next to me who started to yell at me. My lungs were filling completely up. The doctor was screaming, the ship is sinking. I heard the machine crash. They were still working and I was above my body looking down at everything going on. Death experience is an experience of otherworldliness that happens at the edge of death. People who almost die close to death or to someone who has died and later is resuscitated or revived. Whether pleasant or unpleasant, because we can have the frightening ones as well as the joyous ones. My name is Paul. In December 2010, I had a near-death experience. I was having a severe bout with depression, and I drank a lot of liquor, took a lot of meds, and then I went upstairs at my home and hung myself from the raptors. I went to what some people would call the void. This experience is of such significance to the point of lifelong physiological and psychological changes. My name is John. I had a near-death experience in 1998. I was 23 years old. At the time, I was sort of a, a spiritual or religious skeptic, I guess. I've always been a very logical, mathematical thinking person. I think a lot more about spirituality now, I guess. I was at the time, and I still am now, a laser artist and technician. I had been very sick. I had the flu. I was also preparing to take a trip to California for the first time in my life. The day I got on the plane, I was still pretty sick. 
we had a party to go to and there was going to be lots of free food catered. I was just feeling well enough. I was feeling like I could eat some free food. So I went to the party and started to help myself to the catered food. At some point, I started to feel like I'd eaten a nut and I'm allergic to nuts. I just tried to wash that feeling out of my mouth. I had this sort of scratchy feeling and it sort of died down a little bit. It started to feel better. So I just went on with the party. Well, here I am in California for the first time and I'm on the beach and I really wanted to go down and see the Pacific Ocean. My girlfriend and I went down the side of the cliff and we're running around having a good time. I started to get a little bit out of breath. I sat down on a rock. I'm asthmatic as well, so I had a, an inhaler with me and took a shot of that. And my girlfriend, she says, are you okay? Your eyes are bloodshot and your face is all pale. I thought for a second, maybe she actually is seeing something that I'm not seeing or feeling here. So I looked down at my fingernails and my fingernails were turning bluish. To me, having asthma growing up, that's a, a sign that I'm not getting enough oxygen. So I immediately just stood up and started walking back felt my body locking up. It was getting harder for me to breathe. I just turned to my girlfriend and I said, get help. And she started to walk a little faster in front of me back toward the party. Just before she was out of earshot, I said to her, run. Felt I had to tell her before she was too far away to hear me. And as soon as she was around the corner, I sat down on the next rock that I could find and I just tried to focus on breathing. I just sat there and hunched over sort of chanting this to myself, I've got to breathe, I've got to breathe, I've got to breathe, you've got to look up. And I, that didn't make sense to me because because my muscles are locking down here and uh, so I just kind of ignored it. Went back to, I've got to breathe, I've got to breathe, I've got to look up. It sort of came more of like a voice to me in, in my head this time. And so I decided to, okay, this this is crazy, but I'm, I'm gonna look up for a second. And I sat back and I, and I looked up it was the most beautiful sight I'd ever seen. Yes, we like the ones that happen in accidents and hospitals because we have machinery there, we have witnesses there, we have all kinds of ways of cataloging and measuring and checking. But I think we need to realize that they can happen in all kinds of different ways. My name is Sharon. I've had two near-death experiences. My first near-death experience was when I was 13. I was taking swimming lessons. My instructor wanted us to dive headfirst into the 10-foot section of the pool. And I watched all the other kids do it, but I had this strange fear. I just couldn't do it. My instructor told me that if I didn't dive, he was going to throw me in, and he did throw me in. I ended up sinking to the bottom of the pool with my lungs filled with water. That's when it happened. My second near-death experience happened when I was in my 40s. I was sitting on my back steps. My husband at the time was an electrician. He had just got home and I had asked him if it was okay for me to be talking on a cordless phone. He said that I would be all right and he went in the house. That lightning just came right down and hit my arm. The phone went flying. I've never felt such searing pain in my life. And it knocked me to the ground. After it hit my arm, it traveled underneath the house and blew out the transformer that was directly in front of our house. It left char marks on the concrete steps where I had been sitting. That lightning just went right through me. The next thing I know, I see these beautiful pink and gold clouds. It was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. The pattern of the near-death experience is truly universal. The components and aspects of that pattern will vary, but the pattern, the overall pattern is the same. How they describe that will depend on language constraints, it will depend on their culture, their own belief system, or what is acceptable in the community around them. 
Hi, my name's Nola Davis, and I had my NDE between the years of two and three years old. So to talk a lot about how life was before then, I guess I was just a normal two, three-year-old child. So at two years old, I got extremely ill and had croup, and this was in the mid-50s where we lived in rural Washington. I had not yet ever done tracheotomies before. I remember not being able to breathe and then being in the hospital room above the bed. The next thing I remember was this incredible iridescent light. My name is Roland E. Webb. I had a near-death experience August 9, 1988 in the Philippines. I was stationed in the military in the U.S. Air Force at the time. My mom and dad, they were Catholics. They didn't push us to any church, so they were pretty open-minded, and I remain open-minded. I went to the library on base and picked up a book called Total Meditation. In the Philippines, it's hot. It's usually close to in the high 90s, 100, 102, 3, 4, 5, like that. Humidity is sky high. Um, I came out the library, had a short sleeve shirt on, and then I felt the sun prickling my skin. You know, I'm brown. It's kind of off for me to get sunburned. We were running 12 and 13, 14 hour shifts out there in a hot tarmac, working on airplanes, inspecting airplanes and all that. Came home tired and sicker than a dog. And in the Philippines at that time, you couldn't call 911. All of a sudden, everything started spinning and spinning and round and round and round. And the more it spun, the more nausea I got. The more I went to these cold sweats, the more intense the headache, everything started caving in. And then it got to the point where I could not fight it anymore. And I said, sayonara, and I let go. And when I let go, the most beautiful light came somewhere around my eyes. My name is Kathy McDaniel, and I had my near-death experience the first part of 2000. We're not sure when that happened because I was in a coma. I was 53 years old, and I had recently retired, sold my property management business. I was looking for a new life. I had just finished a long-term relationship. One of my best friends was going to come to Seattle and have a bone marrow transplant and needed a second caregiver. So I came. It was supposed to be a three or four month ordeal, but it turned into eight months. And by that time I was very run down, I got pneumonia. So I went into a knock in the box place and collapsed. They put me in an ambulance. And by the time I got to the hospital, they said I'd got into ARDS, which is acute respiratory distress syndrome. And that I had about a 40% chance of making it. So they called in my family from all over and I got more and more in distress, so they put me into a drug-induced coma. I stayed there for about three weeks, fighting back and forth. One day I was good, one day I wasn't good. And at one point they told my family to come in and say goodbye, that there was nothing more they could do. So I'm not sure when I slipped over, but I did. I just was somewhere else. Hi, I'm David Bennett. I had a near-death experience back in 1983. I was the chief engineer of the research vessel Aloha. I was off the California coast in early March. We were trying to outrun a storm, but we didn't quite outrun the storm. Instead, the storm caught up to us, so we couldn't bring the large ship into the harbor, but we had some people on board that needed to make some flights to LAX. The captain thought it would be a good idea to put a rubber Zodiac into the water and we would bring these people into the harbor. As chief engineer, I usually stay on the ship till we hit the dock. But because I was third officer, I knew the harbor better than anybody else on the boat. The captain thought it'd be prudent if I went along just to help navigate. We went down, put on our life vests and we jumped in the Zodiac and we started heading in. There were 20 foot swells that night, 20, 25 footers. We would ride up on the top of a 25-footer and try to get a bearing on the harbor buoy and then quickly run down the trough and up to the top of the next swell, take another bearing and keep doing that. Well, it wasn't very long. We lost track of the harbor buoy altogether. The storm had blown us a mile south of the harbor and we ran into the sandbar area where there were suddenly 25-foot breakers and we slid off of one within a second. 
So we tried to turn her about and take her back out to sea where we knew it would be safer and find a safer approach. But just as we got the boat turned around above our head, there was the next one. And it came right down on top of us catapulted me into the ocean. I was being tumbled and tossed like a rag doll. I mean, this is a very ferocious sea that we found ourselves caught up in. I'm a commercial diver as well as being chief engineer on a research vessel. We wear a lot of different hats. Spent a lot of my life commercially as a diver. So I didn't freak out, but it was nighttime. So I didn't know what was up and down. And I had lost total orientation by being tumbled and tossed so much by this violent sea. I tried to blow some bubbles out to sea, but that was no good because everything was just turbulent. I figured, well, I just hang on to this life vest and I'll let it carry me up to the surface. But that didn't happen and I drowned. And suddenly I'm in this peaceful, quiet, calm, very comfortable place. I'm Louisa and I had a near-death experience in 1982. I come from a family that had a lot of good gifts in it. We were taught that God was something superstitious from the past, that science had since proven to be a bunch of silliness. Any kind of spiritual stuff was people's way of comforting themselves because they were afraid of reality. I was also an alcoholic home. We learned to focus on all the good stuff and anything that you didn't want other people to know about just didn't exist, you just get rid of it. When I was a teenager, I developed an obsessive compulsive disorder. I just hid that from the world. I hid it from everyone. It haunted me because I couldn't believe when I was my normal integrated self that I kept doing these things that were so horrible to me. So I made a big vault in my mind where I could hide stuff the world couldn't see. I went to Vassar and I was Phi Beta Kappa, lots of awards, and when that was over, I didn't know how to keep excelling, so I moved to New York City. I hadn't had a date in high school. In New York, I was gonna make up for all that, and I was gonna be a nightclub queen. What I thought is if I could just get high enough, if I could just dance well enough, it would come together and I would finally feel like I was enough. So we went to this nightclub. I felt like this was the night I was going to get there. I was going to be enough. I felt like I was looking real hot and everything that was very important to me then. And we did a whole lot of cocaine and drank a lot. I was almost to the top. I was almost where I wanted to be. So we decided to buy some more. And there was this seedy guy, and he, he said, yeah, I've got stuff. So we bought it. We did some of this, and it did nothing, no high. So being a good addict, I'm like, well, I'll just do it all. And I didn't know it at the time, but that was lidocaine, not cocaine. I went in the bathroom, and I realized I couldn't read the graffiti at all. What lidocaine does is it shuts down a lot of your automatic nervous system. So my heart was beginning to shut down. My breathing was beginning to shut down. My brain wasn't getting enough oxygen. So this tunnel began to close. But I thought, wow, there's a new effect of Coke that I didn't even know about. So, wow, I'm getting some wicked tunnel vision here. And so I wasn't afraid until it started to get so dark that I was having trouble seeing and it felt like I was suffocating. I went out and I found my friend and I said, well, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, something's wrong, there's no air down here. He said, we'll get you some water, which I didn't want, and uh, took me to the bar and the bartender said, here, here's a glass of water. I took it and I raised it to my lips and it was right at the point when I took a sip that I left my body. My name is Elizabeth, and I had four near-death experiences in my lifetime. To start with my last near-death experience, at 33, I had some major surgery. I remember being all of a sudden out. The next thing I knew, I could hear the doctor and the anesthesiologist arguing. They were saying, I can't tell her family that she's not here anymore. I saw a lot of blood. and. 
The next thing I knew, I was in this familiar place that I had been many times before. My name is David Beckman. I had a near-death experience when I was 33 years old in 1988. I was selling word processing equipment for IBM. I was a suit guy. And since, you wouldn't know it today, but I haven't been. It was a nice sunny day in July, and I was going river rafting with some friends of mine. It was a period of my life when I felt pretty much 10 feet tall and indestructible, and I was ready for some adventure and some adrenaline. I wanted to get all the splash and the adventure and the drop coming at me first. When we hit calm water, I would dive out of the raft and swim underneath try to thrill and amaze all my friends. And when we had the opportunity to hit some class five rapids that the veterans in the raft said were better to portage around, I said, no, let's go for it. I changed places with a guy who was on the back of the raft, started going down the rapids. We hit a big boulder that caused the raft to go perpendicular and I went out. It's the only one. Even when I went out, I thought I was in for a great adventure, but within just moments, I knew I was in big trouble. But it didn't take long. Even though I was doing everything I was trained to do, I eventually wore out and was beat up enough from the rocks and not getting enough oxygen that I knew that I was gonna die. I waited for it to happen, and it was just moments. Suddenly, I was just somewhere else. My name is Virginia Drake. I live in Kentucky, and I had four near-death experiences. I was my mother's seventh miscarriage. I was a pound and seven ounces in 1951. I should never survive that. Then I drowned twice at the age of 11 and 16. At 46, I was a teacher. I have two sons. We look like a wonderful, happy family. We had the big house, we had the cars, we had the pool, and we all should have been happy and none of us were. The week before my heart attack, I just literally had sat down to watch TV. Nobody was there. I think it was like an Oprah Winfrey thing, and I couldn't understand why the guy was on there. He kept saying, I take 90 pills a day. Don't get a heart transplant. And I'd even look around thinking, is he talking to me? And I would go on and then he'd say it again, don't get a heart transplant. In the middle of this little conversation, I raised my hand and said, I will not get a heart transplant. I'm 46 years old. What are you trying to say? And I just thought, is it in my mind? What's going on? And then literally a week later, I'm laying in an emergency room and they're saying she's having a heart attack. That was the first day of summer break. I had my son and a couple other kids and I kept getting really sick and I felt a pain in my chest. It felt like an anaconda and an elephant sat on me, but I didn't think anything about it because I'd just been three weeks prior to that in the emergency room while I was teaching, I had acid reflux. They said, you're gonna feel like you're having a heart attack. I was cleaning out trash and I was putting it in the trash can and I leaned over and the trash can filled up with water where I was perspiring so much from this heart attack and I knew that wasn't correct. So I went down to the principal's office and that's where my secretary Mary was and they called my son and got him to come take me home. But when I got there I went straight upstairs thinking I must have pulled a muscle and went straight into the hot tub. I vomited before I ever got there, and I thought, that's a little odd, why would I vomit? I ran back up three more flights of steps thinking, well, I'll just lay down for a minute. And then my cats are the ones that were the indicators. They just kept staring at me. And I thought, there's something wrong. And I heard a voice literally say, you need to go to the mirror and look at the mirror. Well, when I went into my bathroom, and I was very ashen gray, and I heard a voice say, you need to go to the emergency room now. That voice was the same voice that warned me about having a car accident almost 30 years before. So I went on down the steps and I said, we need to go to the emergency room. He got me in the car. He dropped me off at the emergency room in our little hospital. I remember the lady at the desk said, uh, uh, and she kept looking at me. I said, well, I'm having some chest pains. I think I'm having acid reflux. She said, you need to go back there now. 
And I thought, well, see, it's a small town. They recognize me. I'm really all about myself, you know, then. And I'm laying there, and I had a friend there that I went to high school with who was a nurse, and she looked at me, and she said, you need to lay down. And I said, okay. And that's when I left my body. That's really when something inside of me pulled me inside of myself, and I was viewing everything through my solar plexus. My name is Judith White, and I actually had three near-death experiences, one at four and a half, one at five and a half, and one at 35. The two, when I was real young, I had to go to a hypnotherapist to pull those out. But I had read some books about children who've had these experiences. It was, oh my gosh, that's me, that's me. So that led me to go to a hypnotherapist to pull out the information. And it was due to illness, both at four and a half and five and a half. At 35, I went on a ski trip with a friend. We were on our way home, and I was driving. I could see that there was a drunk driving in the T part of a road. My part of the road ended in a stop sign. I had slowed way down to five miles per hour, and I passed out before my car was hit. I was hit as the driver. Later, I was told that there were five ways I should have been killed instantly, according to the doctors. The seatbelt broke and the steering wheel did a different angle that's not common. But the weird part of it was that it was like I fell asleep, but I didn't fall asleep. The body somehow knew what was coming. My ski partner was not hurt at all. He said it took the ambulance about an hour to get to us because we were way out in the country. They keep trying to wake me up, ask me who my dad, my mom. I had a bad head concussion, obviously. And then when we got to the hospital, they were cutting all the clothes off of me to see what kind of damage they had to deal with. And they kept trying to wake me up, and so I was brought back again. But after that, I went into a coma, finally, and was able to experience paradise. My name is Kimberly Clark Sharp. I had a near-death experience in 1970. My life before my near-death experience was rock solid, stuck in place, never gonna change. And that's how I wanted it. I grew up in Kansas, lazy Lutheran and wealthy. My dad was senior partner in a law firm that represents to this day, all the tobacco companies in the United States and Canada. So we were materialistic, non-spiritual, loving family. Coming to our home was like checking into a nice hotel. I would easily describe myself as shallow, materialistic, nervous, anxious about society, about how I was perceived, self-aware, and really hated change. Hated change so much that I planned to marry a boy I'd known since the seventh grade because his last name was Clark. My last name was Clark. I wouldn't have to change the monograms on the towels. I was stuck, and happily so. One day, while getting my first auto license, I was with my dad, in perfect health. I would have to share my father's perspective because I have no memory from the day I died, none at all. According to my father, we are at the Shawnee Mission, Kansas Department of Motor Vehicles. Great place to have a near-death experience. You saw my license photo, you too would almost die. There's just like so many jokes I can think of. Dead at the DMV, it's just ridiculous. But there I was literally waiting for my number to come up when I said to my father that I was feeling funny and I wanted to sit down. There weren't any chairs apparently. Got through the wait time, signed all the papers appropriately. We were leaving the building, we were at the doorway and he noticed that my complexion was white on white. And then I fell into and threw his arms onto the sidewalk. A uniformed nurse happened to be passing by. She saw that I had collapsed, ran over, determined that I didn't have a heartbeat, that I wasn't breathing. So two phone calls were made, one to a Kansas City, Missouri hospital, and the other to the Shawnee Mission Department of Volunteer Firefighters. The firefighters arrived first. They had a brand new 
portable ventilator. It had two features. One, of course, to ventilate, which is what you want when someone isn't breathing. But sometimes people stop breathing because their airways are blocked with food in particular. This portable ventilator had a second function, and that was to vacuum out an object to clear the airway, and then a switch could be flicked and air would go in. Ta-da! Patient saved. So they slapped this airtight device to my face, turned it on, and it was on vacuum mode. So it violently sucked out whatever oxygen was left in my body, and already I hadn't been breathing for a few minutes. They knew immediately what had happened, because according to my father, even the ends of my fingers turned blue-black. They flicked the switch, started pumping the air in, while my lungs had sufficiently collapsed, our lungs being sticky suckers. There needs to be a steady pressure to unglue them. A blast of air is not a steady pressure. It's an insult at that point. The air had to go somewhere. My lungs couldn't take it all, and I literally inflated like a flash balloon. So then the firefighters gave up and said, I'm sorry, there's nothing more we can do. From the back of this now growing crowd, a man came, bent down, and did what we now call citizen CPR. He looked at my father and said, I'm not getting a fill-in-the-blank expletive. My father's memory ends there. His memory picks up again when the ambulance had somehow arrived. Apparently, I was breathing on my own. I was still unconscious. Body went into the back of the ambulance. Off we went. My medical report, my health sunk again in the emergency room, but by the end of the day, I was out of the woods. That's what my dad's report is. I remember nothing of that day, but everything that was within that day. And that's what we now call a near-death experience. It's just not the near-death experience or the after effects. When you put the two together, then you have a phenomenon, a very unique phenomenon that happens to a lot of people. So obviously, a lot of people don't have them. But, uh, you know, a lot of people do. So we're talking about millions and millions of people here. We're not just talking about a few hundred thousand. Coming up in Episode 2, Out of Body.